Well, greetings, greetings to all and happy new year. Um, and I have to say that I am absolutely thrilled to launch 2023 with our wonderful CIL Dialogue editorial team. And I thank all of you who are joining us today. And also, I know that now many actually watch us afterwards on video, so greetings to all of you as well. So um, the CIL Dialogue blog was launched September 8th, 2022, when we held an online event with Tommy Co. And I have to say in these short four months, CIL Dialogues has been busy. We've had four symposia on really a broad range of issues from climate change, World War II in Asia, customary international on human rights. And in addition, six intervention, live events, and a number of authors have intervened. Um, so I have to say to the editorial team, except Massimo, who can't be with us today, thank you so much. You've done an absolutely brilliant job. Um, so today we decided we'd get together for uh, a conversation. And it's an opportunity for us to sit and reflect um, the past year, 2022, for international law, looking a little bit into the future, and also um, doing a little bit of uh, assessment of the blog, what we've done and where we're going. So having said that, um, we have our team here, Sien Li, Dina, um, Wei Ling, Yvette, and Martins, our editor-in-chief, fantastic, wonderful. So what I thought we could do is, again, this is informal, but I could kick off with a couple of questions to you. Um, so I have one set of questions that have to do with international law in general and another about CIL dialogues, but it's entirely up to you if you have something else you would like to talk about. Um, we're not under a strict set of rules. All right, so let me just ask all of you then the first questions, and this has to do with international law. So in your opinion, in 2022, what was the big event or the major development? All right, start with that. Who wants to go first? How about Martins, editor-in-chief? You could go first. Uh, well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Nilofer, for, um, for the wonderful and, wonderful and very, very kind and charitable introduction of of the blog or for uh giving me the floor let me just say at the outset that we are a very non-hierarchical uh, institution <laughs> uh, so in uh, i think as uh, as i'm sure that my uh, colleagues will disagree and challenge uh, me later uh, i mean i think it's uh, as as a side note of course i think it's with with particularly in the region i think it's impossible if we think about the big questions methodologically not to not to the famous work of judge charlesworth and the question about um whether international law is best uh, and most important are the big things or are the small things but um i mean i think in 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 terms of um big questions and as the first one, and suppose as an Eastern European international lawyer, uh, it must be uh, the reaction of the international community uh, to a Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine, uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine, to use the General Assembly terminology in February. And I think that I choose, I think that the big thing is not the aggression itself, but it is the reaction of uh, the international community, uh, particularly by uh, taking um, the international institutional mechanisms, really, I suppose, really sort of many of the classic uh, aspects of international courts and tribunals, general assembly work, work of specialized institutions seriously. And to me, it shows the fundamental truth about the character of the international legal order is decentralized character suggests that rules fall not on the persuasiveness on their contents, 
but on the sheer consensus of the subjects of the international society or community, uh, as the German speaking uh, might draw the distinction. And I think on this point, the international uh, legal order has shown that it finds it important not unanimously, I think that many have skillfully drawn attention to the various ways of emphasis, but I think against the benchmark of the extraordinary diversity of international law, the extent to which international legal order has responded in a broadly consistent manner has been quite quite extraordinary. I think that we really, uh, one cannot really think of comparable examples outside a few uh, in the United Nations era, early invasion of Iraq, uh, by Iraq of Kuwait, uh, uh, resistance against apartheid South Africa, that strikes me as the big event. Yeah, yeah, thanks, uh, Martins. Uh, indeed, I think that the, um, the Uniting for Peace resolution really was extraordinary, and it certainly put its mark on 2022. Um, uh, who else? I, and I, we're not in any hierarchy, but I picked on Martins to, to break the ice. So anyone else want to jump in? Did we lose um, uh, Dina? Is she there? Or is it just- Oh, I think actually she is raising her hand. I'm here. Oh, okay. Oh, gosh. Why did it? All right. It's my screen, I guess. Okay. All right, Dina, since you've got your hand up. Please. Oh, good. Thank you so much. And thanks. Also, I want to thank you, uh, Lilo, for, for the opportunity to put together this blog and to be on board with this really, really awesome team. Um, all has happened under your uh, leadership and auspices, and it's great uh, to be part of such an initiative. So I, I mean, obviously, I agree with Martins uh, that it's impossible to ignore um, the the reaction to to Russia's aggression. Going actually, as he he perhaps um, alluded to, to more ordinary things, but I think ordinary things that can have a huge impact. I would say the wave of withdrawals of European states from the Energy Charter Treaty is something that is worth keeping um, in our minds in the sense that it is one of the instances in which Perhaps the most interesting issue is not so much the legal mechanics and the doctrinal questions. There are, of course, issues pertaining to that, especially when it comes to the transitional period um, from now on. But I would say the big issue is the systemic question, right? That a number of European states, European states that to different extents, but generally they had either passively or very actively supported things like investors, state dispute settlement in other contexts have started seeing the effects that this has and might have in the future um, when it comes to climate change, right? And it was it was really clear, for example, in the withdrawal of Spain and other states that the Paris Agreement was explicitly cited as a reason, right? The idea was very explicitly that um, obligations under the Energy Charter Treaty cannot be reconciled with obligations under the Paris Agreement. I would say other agreements that have to do with climate change, domestic law in many cases pertaining to climate change, international human rights law even. Um, and I think that the number of states who seem to be withdrawing, who have already either officially announced their withdrawal or they have signaled their desire to withdraw is very important, especially as I said, because it is happening amongst European states. Um, that historically have been claimants rather than respondents. And because I think it raises also questions about um, climate change and how it's dealt with within the investment law sphere in general. I think it will be obviously difficult politically, if not legally, for these states to then um, support the conclusion of new, for example, bilateral investment treaties that, that have ISDS clauses and cover 
um, uh, energy and climate related matters. Um, so I think that's very important. But I think what's also quite important and interesting is the reaction we saw very often, sometimes on social media, um, by um, professional, either international lawyers or um, bureaucracy related professionals of the Energy Charter Treaty, I would say unseemly and unbecoming uh, would probably be um, the best um, the best description for some of the things that we saw happening online. And I think that's also interesting um, because, of course, it raises issues about the role of the professionals of international law in issues like climate change, right? Of course, there's many professionals, international lawyers, who are playing a pivotal role in efforts of mitigation and adaptation. But if we look outside, perhaps, environmental or international human rights law, there is also many international lawyers who perhaps play um, a role that is um, actively undermining efforts yeah. to stay yeah. um, close to 1 or 1.5 degrees. And I think that raises, of course, questions of professional responsibility and professional ethics, right? Especially when this support happens in very, very explicit and even slightly <laughs> offensive terms online. But even when it doesn't, even when decorum is maintained, I think the question of what is the role of international lawyers for an existential threat? You know, sometimes mm. we use the word existential threat lightly, I think this is actually one of the instances that is worth it. Um, I think the, the, the wave of withdrawals and the role of international lawyers is yeah. something that is worth, you know, keeping a note yeah. of yeah. and thinking about as we move forward to 2023. Yeah, no, no, no. I, yeah, it is really fascinating. And I think, uh, Dina, it, you know, that really the investment issues were really under the radar. And, and it's now becoming a big issue, climate and these investment tr treaties, these disputes, the arbitration process, the lawyers, et cetera, et cetera. So I think you've hit upon something that we can even talk more about. Um, Wei Ling, you had your hand up, so please. I'm sure that um, CNL has some uh, more to say on this topic that I'm going to raise. I think that in December, the UN Security Council passed a landmark resolution on Myanmar. I think that's really important because this conflict has been in the news for over a year and uh, not much has been done in comparison to uh, conflicts in other areas of the world. So I think this probably would give more spotlight to the importance uh, for action and for and questions about how effective international law is when it comes to dealing with such a drawn out conflict in the region. I'm sure Sian Li has something else to say about this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And this is something that, you know, we're trying to follow um, the situation in Myanmar and human rights um, and ASEAN and Sian Li, you are definitely the ASEAN law expert. So why don't you, you can pick up from uh, the ball was thrown over to your, your court. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, Dean. Uh, thanks, thanks, Nilfa. Uh, thanks, Wei-Ling. So, yeah, on the Myanmar issue, um, well, you know, the conflict has been going on for decades. Obviously, in, in what has been picked up by the media is when 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 things get exceptionally bad, right? Um, but the Myanmar conflict, so there is the junta. So currently, you know, what we're looking at is, is the aftermath of the coup, but, um, and the violence and the extrajudicial killings and the imprisonment and the military tribunals, which have given snap um, death penalty judgments for the detractors. So that's what we see in the press. But as everyone knows, the persecution of the ethnic minorities has been going on for a very long time. Since 2017, uh, mass exodus and persecution of the Rohingya. So there was a ceasefire maybe in 2021. So we didn't see so much of that. But then obviously in neighboring Bangladesh, um, 
and the refugee camps within Myanmar itself, those are uh, burgeoning, they're bursting. Um, and recently, well, just in the past month, we see many refugee boats that are stuck in the Indian Ocean. They leave, mm -hmm. all right, because the situation is so dire. Are they going to get repatriated to Myanmar, which is now under a very an even more brutal regime? Um, or, you know, it seems hopeless, right? I mean, if one wants to be realistic about this, where do we see an end to human suffering? And what can the international community, what can international law do? Uh, it seems like we can do very little. Um, so, but let's just put it out there that uh, in 2021, um, the UN General Assembly passed a resolution, right? And then in December 2022, the UN Security Council passed another resolution. Um, and then there was Gambia um, bringing the case, mm -hmm. right? Um, and there is, so, so there are these issues. And also at the regional level, ASEAN has been trying um, through its five point consensus, whether as a regional block, and then there have been bilateral engagements. So there are international law or rules-based engagement uh, going on, but um, as many have said, uh, ultimately the junta is not willing to budge, right? It's really, really unwilling to budge. And I, I spoke with um, some Myanmar people. Um, yeah, you know, uh, it would seem like um, mm, the junta does not care, right? So, so what can we do? I mean, there have been uh, discussions about, um, you know, Myanmar citizen, you know, in, in, in international media holding placards of R2P responsibility to protect because they are in such dire straits that they say, please come invade us to save us from this. You know, this is humanitarian intervention, use of force to rescue. But obviously the international community is not going to do that. And also many Asian and ASEAN countries are not supportive of armed intervention uh, on humanitarian grounds. So, so we are not very sure how it will um, play out. But, and and, and yeah. the notion of a, a regional uh, human rights court, I imagine, has it ever been discussed actually? I mean, you've got for Europe, you've got for Latin America. Um, I mean, the whole thing about the ASEAN way of dispute resolution and Wheeling, you had your hand up as well. Yeah. So Actually, um, so first of all, Sandy, I'm very sorry. I didn't mean to throw the ball to your court. I just wanted to like start um, have a, a, a discussion and dialogue, you know, bounce the ball to and fro. <laughs> so I think that what is really interesting about the Myanmar, what we hear about very often is the efforts on the international level, the ICC. We also hear about it, um, regionally, we hear the efforts at the regional level. But I think that what is interesting is that you also see things being played out at the national level that doesn't really get reported that much in the news. So when the refugees are going into Malaysia, how does Malaysia deal with it? And as an interesting development before the Indonesian Constitutional Court, there's not really been reported the news, whereby some civil society actors are attempting to bring a case to the Indonesian Constitutional Court, asking the court to, to consider whether Indonesia's laws on um, the prosecution of core international crimes should be amended to include universal jurisdiction so that it could extend to the prosecution of Myanmar generals. So that would be an interesting case to look at. And I think that this is also an interesting case because it looks it shows us how international law is not only operates at the international level, the regional level, but also at the national level at home. Yeah. The vertical and horizontal, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that, um, and, and, and we talk about Asia, but similar issues happening in Europe, of course, with um, the you know asylum seekers. The it's a huge issue, but you have different mechanisms. I think it's interesting to see that you have, um, and so I don't know, doing it compares to those mechanisms. 
Well, we've looked a little bit, and I think it's a big question, of course, what are the big events for 2020? So many, to be quite honest. Um, but now let's kind of look into the future a little bit, at least 2023. And, and so what, um, in your, uh, the, the famous crystal ball we referred to, so what do you see uh, for 2023, uh, the developments of international law? And one thing I want to raise too is obviously we have to think about the role of courts and tribunals. We know that there's a lot of, it seems to be that advisory opinions are quite um, becoming very popular. Um, so anyway, just some thoughts on 2023. What can we expect um, as international law scholars and lawyers? Um, so whoever likes to take the first crack. Dina, go ahead. Sinli, do you want to go first? Put your hand, I can't see his hands up first, so. I think she raised her hand. Oh, no, no, Dina, go ahead. And then oh, right. her hand up, yeah. I'll go <laughs> Thank after. You. I think Lilo for really, um, you you nailed it in the head in the head, right? I was going to to highlight two dispute settlement issues or two court and tribunal issues. Of course, the first, as you alluded to, is the fact that we now have the text of um, the resolution for asking an advisory opinion on the legal obligations related um, to climate change and as this makes its way through the different mechanisms um, of the United Nations on its way um, to the ISCJ and on its way to um, hopefully triggering um, a helpful advisory opinion. That's definitely a thing to look out for. Um, but I think that, the, in a sense, the flip side of that is... Maybe 2023 will be, you know, the final um, nail in the coffin uh, of the WTO dispute settlement <laughs> issue. Um, we now know that the United States um, has lost on panel level two cases in which it was in, um, invoking national security. Um, one related to steel and steel products uh, from China and the other one related to designating products from Hong Kong as um, originating from China. Both cases were lost, but of course, already the United States has triggered, has um, indicated its unwillingness um, to comply. And of course, we know they can always, because of the absence of an appellate body, they can appeal into the void, um, which will mean then we will be deadlocked. Um, and of course, once again, this is legally, the answer is very obvious, but I think in terms of legal design and institutional design, um, it, it's, it's, an epoch making uh, change, right? To see the United States that spearheaded the development of the WTO, but also the um, the legalization of dispute uh, settlement in trade, right? And one doesn't need to think that this was an unequivocally good thing. I don't think it was an unequivocally good thing to think that it is a huge development, both for international law and for international um, relations. And to link it also back to investment, I think we are about to also start seeing the um, more importance being placed in, in the uh, national security clauses in investment treaties. So I think the issue is about, I think 2023 will be a, a year when we will start seeing national security clauses being um, invoked in multiple fora of adjudication. Um, and it would be interesting to see if these fora are up to the task, right? If there's, of course, the politics of it, but I think there is also a judicial function aspect of it, including, for example, the fact um, that there was considerable, I think, correct um, criticism of the steel and steel products um, panel decision for basically dodging the issue, right? Uh, it didn't really uh, answer the question, especially as it really exists. So, yes, I think we the question, in a sense, would be how will adjudication look like in a post-unipolar world 
in mm-hmm. which invocations of security move from rhetorical invocations to legal invocations in the context of dispute settlement. Can these bodies respond to them in an adequate way, let's say jurisprudentially adequate way? And even if they do, does it really matter? Is anyone listening anymore? This is, I think, the the big thing. Yeah, yeah, no, I think... um, yeah, so you're heading on between the energy charter, the WTO, you're doing the, the 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 coffin and the nail, but also, and this is maybe we can talk about, you know, are we seeing a shift? What's the shift happening? How much of that will we see in 2023 in terms of, you say, the post-unipolar world? Um, are we seeing the making and unmaking of international law as we know it? So who wanted to go next? Um, Yvette? Go for it. Thank you. Um, So I just wanted to make a few comments, hopefully short, hopefully not too long, um, building from the previous discussion, because I think part of the mission to look forward is to also take into consideration what happened in 2022. Oh, dear. Did my Zoom crash? Hopefully not. You're frozen, but we can hear you. Keep going. Oh, no. What happened? Oh, we lost Evap. Are you there? Oh, there Am you I are. back? Yes, yeah. you're back. Go okay, on. great. 2022 was, um, you know, an exciting year. Hopefully, uh, 2023 will have some developments on past events. I think one area that I'm interested in keeping an eye out for is uh, this Myanmar situation. The, um, the, the situation there is just, it's indescribably horrific, but one thing I will cross my fingers for is maybe the the combined effect of the UN Council's resolution and also with maybe a new ASEAN chair coming in Mm -hmm. for this year. Hopefully this will create like a crescendo of uh, change that will finally bring a resolution to the conflict there because it's it's been a long time and I really hope that something something makes a difference at this point. Um, Another topic that I thought about while uh, Dina and also you, Nelifer, were talking about uh, it, you know, dispute settlement, etc. I think that one other space to keep an eye out for is uh, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. With the whole uh, WTO dispute settlement system uh, maybe grinding to a halt, maybe finally being resolved, we're not so sure. I think that the RCEP provides an interesting space to at least uh, think about the possibility of a different dispute settlement system happening. Of course, there is always going to be the question of will it even be used in the first place? Because <laughs> if, if um, you know, history proves itself to, his, history repeats itself, I don't think a case is that likely to happen anytime in the near future. But the at least from my understanding of the chapter 19, it's quite well designed. It does address some of the WTO's faults. It's not foolproof for sure, but any case I think would be worth discussing because it'll be something new to uh, kind of not say take down existing international laws or international trade regimes, but I think it'll provide a different perspective to analyze cases from um, you know an ASEAN or you know Asia centric kind of point of view. Okay, it was something to look forward to, definitely. Yeah, dispute settlement. Um, yes. Oh, very good. Thank you, Yvette. I have, and I want to say to our participants, we don't, we know you're out there, we can't see you, but please feel free to chime in with comments on chat and questions. Stanley. I have a very quick question to Dina. So you were talking about, uh, you know, maybe national security interests, um, you know, trumping uh, international dispute settlement. Is that re- really for, so, so to clarify, is that across the spectrum of uh, disputes or primarily international economic law? I, I just want to know a little bit more because, you know, looking at it as well. I definitely think more about international um, economic law, right? Definitely. I was thinking of, you know, um, our investment lawyers ready for the bleeding of 
um, of uh, national security claims out from the WTO. Right. But I, I wouldn't be surprised, though, if, I mean, of the existing deference, for example, to national security claims in many human rights courts becomes, uh, the pressure for this deference yeah. uh, becomes even greater, right? Especially when it comes uh, to, to nationals, perhaps, of geopolitical competitors and so on and so forth, or to um, securitizing even more issues, for example, as you were referring to of migration um, and refugee flows, right? So no, in a sense, I, I was primarily thinking of that, but I, I can see the pool of security becoming even greater um, in human rights, and it has always been, right, human rights courts have, international human rights courts have been careful um, when it comes to, for example, counterterrorism legislation, even when they found it in violation um, of human rights standards, rightly so, uh, they found violations, rightly so, they tried to tailor the findings in ways that were not very broad, right, but I think, um, in a context of, you know, a new Cold War or whatever you call it, I can't see these claims proliferating. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's too, and the point that Wheeling made, um, this relationship between domestic law and international law. So are we seeing it going more downwards domestic, you know, questions um, of what you said? But anyway, um, who, who, um, Martins? Um, <clears throat> well, thank you, and 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 the conversation has developed so many fascinating branches that it's hard to know where to pop on to. But I have to say that I mean, similarly to Dina, I feel that your question already stole the best answer, and. Um, I mean, I think it sort of reminds me that um, in a slightly uh, sneaky manner, for the last few years, when I uh, begin the first lecture at UCL of the law and policy of international courts and tribunals, I have the same opening line that never before have courts and tribunals been more important, never before have courts and tribunals been more challenged. And I think that a bit like with Olympic Games, I think that I'm not being entirely disingenuous because it seems that with each next year, uh, the point uh, comes even more strongly. And I think, you know, some of the examples for this year have already been highlighted. We will have, as obviously our moderator knows so well, uh, the request for advisory opinion uh, before the International Tribunal for Law of the Sea. While the vote has not taken place yet, from all tea leave readers in the international politics, it seems that there would be an advisory opinion to the International Court of Justice, of course. And actually, I thought that Dina was going there, uh, but I will steal her thunder with the uh, opinion to the request to the International Court of Justice that has been uh, requested in the last um, days of the old year, uh, the advisory opinion regarding uh, Israel, uh, yeah. various um, aspects um, yeah. of uh, Israel and Palestine. So I think, uh, I mean, I think it might be really the year, as, as you said in the question, the year of the advisory opinion. And in a way, I think perhaps in a sort of very aptly addressing both of the large multilateral issues, uh, one at the level of uh, climate change uh, and sea level rise, touching many states in particular, I suppose, especially affected to use the ILC terminology, but also international community more generally. And the second one, normatively touching upon um, very important uh, pressure points of the international legal order. And I think one would imagine, uh, you know, really knowing as much as anybody that in some ways, International Court of Justice might also be uh, trying to think through the implications of one of the topics that um, the CIL Dialogues had a very interesting life symposium on, uh, the interventions by uh, many states um, yeah. in the Ukraine-Russia case regarding allegations of genocide under Article 63, which may to some extent, if not formally, then substantively express interest of 
a part of the international community in its own way. At the same time, I think that, again, Dina put the finger on the issue as well. There are challenges, but I, I have to say that for all of the things that she mentioned, I thought of contravailing tendencies even within the particular regime. So for the appellate body going down, we have the MPIA arbitration going up, and I think the uh, EU Colombia, I mean, they have all these peculiar names. Was it was it Fry's, Colombian Fry's case um, decided? Um, and I mean, it does raise, I suppose, really sort of systemic issues of how we think about the role of international courts and tribunals. Uh, and how do we think of their role in these fundamental security matters? I think that Robert Jennings, the former president of the International Court and also one of the heavily dissenting judges in the Nicaragua case, uh, wrote an article where I think his idea was that we shouldn't think that international courts should naturally be moving from more pedestrian and uncontroversial matters to naturally also rule on matters of great politics. That perhaps the right uh, pitch, as it were, the right ambition for international courts is to remain at a broadly trivial level, uh, that uh, international law does not provide a systemically sustainable space for international courts to rule on these matters. Now, of course, that is, I suppose, a system framing question. Uh, there may be interests for particular actors within the dispute settlement who are disadvantaged, perhaps, by the broader uh, negotiation process to, as it were, break the deadlock and ask uh, specifically the legal issues. Things that are systemically desirable are not necessarily to the interests of every individual actor. But these are, I mean, interesting questions, as I think that Dina's question about the unipolar moment and whether international courts and tribunals, as we have them, to a significant extent shaped by assumptions of 1990s reflected. And arguably, one might say that many of the courts during that period have been either agnostic to the unipolar perspective or actively contravailing it. Nuclear weapons advisory opinions, oil platforms, um, Israeli war case, uh, the current uh, Palestinian embassy case, and so on. And other international courts are at best, I suppose, uh, agnostic in that regard. So these are, I think, strike me as interesting questions. And I think Dina is also absolutely right to point out investment law as something that is implicated. I mean, I guess I tend to take on these questions perhaps a bit of a long durée view. Uh, investment law and treatment of foreigners has always been one of the most uh, controversial things. I, I mean, Catherine Greenman has splendidly explored that uh, in her recent great book. But, I mean, it pretty much it is extraordinary for there at any point to be international consensus. Barcelona Traction tells us that in 1970, the division in international law is too large for any consensus to emerge. So how balance is struck and whether that has been struck successfully, is something that is really being rethought with any next generation. And indeed, I have to say, one thing that makes extraordinary reading was that as recently as in 2010, in the Diallo case, uh, judges al Kashawi and Yusuf, so not at all judges coming from the global north, suggest that it is investment law and arbitration that strikes the reasonable uh, balance, and that is something that one should be looking forward to. So it's, it will be interesting to see. In some ways, perhaps, there is nothing that is more fitting for a post-unipolar world of uh, lack of multilateralism and in institutions as the bare bones investment law. Um, so I think uh, I feel that bleeding out, if anything, will be a long <laughs> process, but most certainly a fascinating one for international lawyers. Yeah, um, thanks, Martins. Um, and and I guess I just wanted to say, did you say that? Was it, did I understand that? Um, that, that trivial matters should be more the purview of uh, international courts and tribunals? And if so, what would be a trivial matter? Right. Well, I mean, that was not my view. That was Robert Jennings' yeah, view. Yeah. Um, what would and, be, yeah. 
Uh, and I mean, I think to, to be fair, it it is. I mean, it's you know possible to view uh, academic perspectives through the lenses of their judicial experience. International relations. What would be international law? What would be a trivial matter? Uh, right, uh, and possibly there are uh, the right answer is that there are none. It's like when uh, Lauter Pact was trying to untangle legal and political, and everything that involves a state uh, is political. But I mean, I, I suppose, you know, in a way, things that uh, pertain to use of force, um, uh, boundaries, uh, certain perhaps human rights questions of constitutional significance. I mean, I think I think that Lauter Pact successfully demolished the idea that there could be analytically sharp lines, but I think it is not um, I think that that was, you know, Jennings's point that, sure, international law can address all these issues, but is it wise? Well, and I think that, so I don't want to take up, but it's interesting, and I just want to follow up a little bit on that, because what's interesting to me, in as we see these advisory opinions, um, and also the, the case, um, the genocide case with Ukraine and Russia, really interesting, 77 countries, I think, last tally. Um, but yet, it seems the scholars seem to be the skeptics, right, about going to courts, and yet we see um, there seems to be an appetite for this, actually, by states. Um, so I don't know, is this a, um, a contradiction? Um, but anyway, I, I just find it really interesting that when, particularly with the advisory opinion um, relating to climate change, I am in the minority and there's some of us here who are actually, you know, positive on that. I think it's a good sign, actually. Of course, the question is important. There's no guarantee. But it seems to me that scholars immediately like, well, let me tell you everything that could go wrong with it. <laughs> so anyway, just to... Uh, 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 can I just say that I was, I was, I was absolutely, absolutely not, not suggesting that. And I think that... No, 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 uh, no, no. no, no. No, no, I know, I know, I know, I know. Uh, no, no. And, and I think, in a way, that the examples that we that we mentioned are mostly of the sorts that courts provide a forum for actors that might be comparatively weaker in other mm, settings. The small to, states, uh, small states, and you know, Ukraine is not a small state, but uh, I think really compared with the institutional uh, capacity, militarily weaker, certainly. And, and I think really, you know, within the United Nations structure, representation on the permanent representation mm -hmm. on Security Council, institutional memory uh, carries its own weight. And in a way, it's, you know, I suppose really, you know, post-1986 framing of courts and tribunals providing uh, access to comparatively weaker actors, which is, of course, you know, I suppose the opposite of the way how courts and tribunals would be viewed in other settings. So I think I I think I'm probably if I had to put myself on the spectrum, I would also be on the I suppose on the cautious optimist side that <laughs> things can work out well if they are worked out wisely. As a wise as a wise lawyer, uh, absolutely. Any other comments on this? And then we can go into another set of questions, but we have a nice, I think, a discussion going on. Any other thoughts? for this topic, future role of uh, the international courts, um, arbitration. Otherwise, we can now talk a little bit about the blog, <laughs> CIL Dialogues. <laughs> and uh, and as, I, as I say, I think, uh, not to be self-congratulatory, but I think it's been doing quite well given, um, what, four months? So I think you've all done, and, and thank you, um, uh, Dina, but you guys have done such a fantastic job. And um, so let me just say this. Let's start off since we're going first looking back. So we're looking four months back and then we'll look into the future. Um, so one thing I think to me, the CIL Dialects has really hit, start, you know, hit the ground running with symposia um, and really very different topics. So we don't have Massimo here, but we do have the three leads. Um, uh, Dina and uh, Wheeling and Sian Li. Um, so if you could tell, so why did you pick the topic? Um, and I just want to know, were you, were you happy with the outcome? 
And I realized that Dina, you and I did it together, but I'm, I'm leaving it to you right now. <laughs> Shall I go first? I think everyone is quiet. <laughs> okay, okay cool. go ahead. Yeah, and I did. Thanks for saying Milfa because I would I I didn't do it by myself. We did it together. Um, so yeah, as as you said, um, we kicked off with a symposium on climate change and international law, partly in light of these initiatives about the two advisory opinions, but also more broadly, and. As my earlier answer indicated, I mean, it's it's the existential issue of our time, right? Um, I cannot see how we can be having any discussion about the international order that does not involve the fact that um, basically both human and non-human life is already um, undergoing through immense challenges and will continue doing so, um, even if you know, we all transitioned to net zero tomorrow, the, the effects would linger on um, for decades to come. But I think the second issue for me is very much the issue of regionalism that both you and Martins have pulled at the center also of CAL dialogues. Um, I am based in Australia, I'm based in the east coast of Australia, um, between Canberra and Sydney. And of course, even though the whole world is affected, by climate change, the global south is much more so, and in particular in the Pacific, there is um, the challenges are even more um, urgent, including, of course, as you all know, the possibility that some low-laying small Pacific states might lose definitely significant part, but even the entirety of their territory within the next 50 years, which of course also raises questions about state continuity and so on and so forth. So I'm trying a little bit to, I, even though I'm not a scholar of climate change and international law, that's not what I have written on so far, I'm trying a little bit to think about what it means to doing international law in time and in place, right? Um, what it means to be doing international law in a settler colony such as Australia, that is also a Pacific power, um, and it has also been historically an imperial power um, in the Pacific, right? And what sort of responsibilities would be dis bestowed upon me as a scholar who is not Australian uh, originally, but works here? And to me, it seems that saying something meaningful about climate change and also, of course, giving platform to voices from the Pacific. For example, Dylan Asafo, um, who is someone, but he's based in New Zealand, who was one of the contributors. So giving platform to international lawyers from the Pacific um, to voice these concerns um, and to think about what international law can and cannot do um, it seems to me that it is, in a sense, the least that I can do uh, as, as a co-editor of SIL Dialogue. So that's, for me, it's the objective importance, but also the subjective importance of being in place in a way that is better rather than worse. Thank you. Yeah, Gina, you said it so well. Um, and it was a great pleasure to be a co lead co-editor with you on that project, I personally was very happy with the outcome. And you're right, to really have regional balance is important. Make sure that we give the voice of international law that is not from the usual, usual suspects. Um, all right, so we also have Wei Ling, can I ask you? Um, yours was such, I mean, a really, really important uh, topic, really interesting. I know I watched um, a fantastic documentary on the Tokyo trials. Um, um, and you did it on World War II in Asia. And I think that um, it was very well done. So turn over to you. Oh, thank you, Denilifa, and the rest of my team for um, going uh, with me on the idea of the symposium. The symposium's title was The Second World War in Asia, Justice Efforts, War Memory and Reparations. It was um, planned to coincide with the anniversary of the end of the war in Asia. And I think the idea behind this is um, that in Europe, um, the, much of the war in Asia remains unknown and its interpretation and impact remains contested. 
So this is a contrast to Europe where the interpretation of the war is uh, this more general consensus. And this history in the region, or at least its invocation, continues to shape international relations and disputes today. So I think it's quite important for us to have open discussions about it. And more importantly, in recent years, there's been increased academic debate, discoveries about wartime events, with the opening and studying of archives, as well as increased civil society debate about reparations or war memory, even within the region, such as in the Philippines and Malaysia. So the idea of having this symposium was to have these less known perspectives and voices have a platform for them to, um, to, to raise certain important issues related to the war. Thank you. And Sian Lee? Yeah, thank you very much. So my symposium was centering around Human Rights Day and wanting to give um, practitioners, policymakers, or aspiring uh, human rights practitioners, those who are in um, young junior scholars now who want to enter the field, some notes of encouragement and wisdom from those who are already in the field. So. The symposium has um, three sharings. Surya Subedi, uh, a Nepalese who is now a professor at Leeds University. Um, professor Te Ongbek, uh, who is a professor in Hawaii. And Priya Gopalan, who is a human rights practitioner uh, based in Malaysia. All of them have very different backgrounds. Right. Although two are professors, um, all have come from very diverse backgrounds. And I think in particular, I would like to highlight uh, Professor Te Ung Baek. He was, he's Korean, yeah, now American. Um, but because of his student activity, um, um, protesting against the Korean dictatorship, right? South Korea was a dictatorship when I was a child. So, so he was a student leader and he was sentenced to death. That was commuted. And then he spent years in solitary confinement. So what I find very remarkable about that, his story um, and also of Surya's and Priya's is that despite the hardship that they have gone through, right? They are not bitter and human rights is a very challenging profession. They are kind, they're hopeful, they're generous, and they also tell us what the practical objectives that we should um, try to achieve if we want to, to go into human rights in the field, right? So we, we kind of know that you need uh, well, you may not need a law degree, but a related field, right? Um, human rights uh, out in the field, uh, you would, I guess, if you work in the UN, you would need a master's. So all these stories of practical achievements that, that and, and perseverance that one would need to have along the way and how to continue in this journey, um, no matter what life throws at us. So um, something to share with everybody and also to grow the, the field of, um, I guess, human rights practice and, and scholarship in Asia. So the human rights scholarship in Asia is, is, is large, but I think what I understand when I meet uh, junior colleagues is that how do we actually get a job in the field? And I think, I mean, we listen to the experts, so yeah. Great, thank you. Um, so here's a question for all of you um, concerning kind of a double question. One, um, so what, what, you know, how important have blogs become for international law scholarship? And where do you see CIL dialogues um, fitting into this area? Um, and then Martins, especially as editor in chief, um, how do you see 2023 um, evolving for um, CIL dialogue? So it's really to all of you, um, this question. So again, who would like to go first? Martin, shall I start with you? 
Of course. <clears throat> Um, and could I just say, not uh, not at all appropriating Massimo's voice, uh, but uh, uh, very briefly to mention uh, the great uh, symposium that he uh, led uh, on um, on the great book by uh, Kammerhofer, Mercuris, Arajarvi, and Mileva on um, the theory, uh, practice, and interpretation of customer international law that uh, drove both on. Uh, great um, established figures at Universal Setting, uh, Michael Wood and Omri Sender, and also leading academic and practitioners engaging with the matter. And I think perhaps, and I think that, that will lead quite neatly to what I think is the, that mercurial mix that uh, CL Dialogues leads people that have very interesting things to say for the Universal audience, but particularly attuned to the Asian uh, regional uh, perspective of uh, practitioners, academics, both from the private practice <clears throat> and uh, governmental service. So I thought that I thought that that was a, a tremendous, a tremendous symposium. Uh, well, perhaps just to kind of to bring back, and I think that a lot of our thinking of what uh, CL dialogues would be was encapsulated in our vision statement uh, and the idea of dialogues not merely I suppose as a form of articulation of engagement but also as telling an important truth about the international legal order both in its mainstream conception and here we nod uh, to a much uh, cited explanation of international law as a process of claim and counterclaim uh, by the late Judge Crawford and also the more theoretical uh, and uh, critical perspectives that ask questions about voices that are not uh, present uh, in dialogues about silences that would be explored and I think so the sort of I mean I well, perhaps I think uh, with a nod to the uh, modern uh, role of slightly less usual forms of expression, I am reminded of the uh, of the great meme from Office, uh, where you know uh, the uh, that we have been asked to say, "Is it this or that?" And the answer, "Why not both?" Uh, and that is, I think, you know that loose idea which I think has been carried out successfully that there need not be the idea that only people based in the Western uh, European and other group states can speak on issues of universal significance and regions as it were remain uh, within their regions. What we saw in the symposium I think are powerful voices on questions of regional significance that are and should be known by universal audience and equally debates about universal issues with a particular uh, experience uh, frame from the regional. So that I think has been, that was our intention to have a, you know, something that reflects the messiness of international community as it is in its decentralized form where everybody is a little bit from everywhere and everybody is a slightly unusual and we are trying to get at the consensus and that has been quite successful. So I hope uh, that for the next uh, year uh, that will continue. We have some very exciting uh, symposium on the cards. Uh, one thing that I would like to note as well is the um, is I think perhaps one of the slightly also unusual things is the easiness with which we engage with the multi-media uh, version and fairly often uh, have a video spin-off of a particularly interesting uh, symposium or blog. Uh, I think and that will, will, will perhaps make a more concerted outreach that this is not only about symposia, so I think it was important to set the symposia as it were to let the world know what we are about. But we're also very, very enthusiastic about attracting uh, individual submissions that fall for us under the rubric of interventions on any topic of international law. But of course, being uh, physically or virtually based in Asia with a particular eye of topics of importance for the region or uh, written by the regional scholars. And I would very much encourage those who might be listening and who have an interesting uh, topic and idea in mind, get in touch with me, get in touch with Yvette, get in touch with any of the editors whom you know better or uh, whose substantive area 
seems to be closer. So I think probably our ambition, perhaps not quite in 2023, but uh, perhaps a midterm ambition is that when uh, an ambitious international lawyer thinks of where to send off their blog post, <laughs> that CIL Dialogues would be one of the top three names that would naturally come to their mind. Well said, well said, Martins, absolutely. Um, I realize, boy, I tell you, this hour is going by so quickly. Um, so I think we can take an extra five minutes um, and, and just so. So everyone, go ahead. Let's, let's continue because it's, so it's been a good discussion so far, I think. All right, who's next? All right, Dina, go ahead. Thanks. I think Martin's mostly covered everything, but um, obviously, yeah, having more individual submissions is definitely something. And I think we have more than 20, 30 people in the audience that goes out to each one of you, especially I would say to more junior scholars, to people who are still PhD candidates um, or early in their practice. We really, really want uh, to hear from, you know, fresh voices, um, that would be one. And the second, of course, about the significance uh, of blogs, you know, I think what, what blogs do offer, you know, is this sort of a rapid response, especially when things are happening um, at, a, at, a, at a hectic pace. And when, of course, I would say due to specialization, it is not very easy for all of us to keep on top of scholarship by reading 12 or 20,000 word articles, especially on topics that are adjacent, but not exactly within our a sphere of interest and expertise, right? It can help you. What I take away from blogs, and I have, I'm trying to do that also with CIL dialogues, is to keep alive the idea of the generalist, um, which I think is a valuable idea um, for international law. And because, you know, there is just so many hours in the day and so many days in the week, this idea perhaps in 2023 and 2024 cannot be always kept alive um, through, you know, extensive scholarship, but through blogs. Of course, there is the flip side, right, which is when you put things out quickly, you might come um, to record it uh, later <laughs> or sooner or later. Um, and that's, I don't think there is anything necessarily shameful about that or anything particularly, you know, that we should really gasp when it happens. But it is something that needs to be taken into account, right? Especially not to end up happening at the detriment of thinking slowly. And I think you can also think slowly in shorter pieces, right? I think you can have a 1500 word piece that you move over. It doesn't, it doesn't always, I think, um, correlate directly with length. We, I think in, in that sense, I think I was really happy to see, for example, historical, like the Wiley's, um, a symposium on World War II to see something on a blog symposium that isn't necessary super contemporary or about the thing that happened last week, right? We can think carefully even and slowly even in a shorter form and I think that is a balance to aspire to, to respond rapidly to the events, but also to, to think carefully and slowly, but in a way that enables people to read it over, you know, drinking their morning coffee. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Dina. And then just wrapping up, we just have a few more minutes. Um, yeah, I would like to add yeah. on to Dina and to Martin. So, you know, the generalist point and also maybe junior scholars, but also in, so big events in international law, but big events in international law scholarship, a very big part in the last, you know, few years has been the decolonization of literature, right? A decolonization of scholarship. And increasingly, we do see long pieces uh, peer-reviewed pieces in big journals and many, many peer-reviewed journals. So that's a very big win for um, the Global South scholarship, which includes us in Asia, in ASEAN, in Africa, in Latin America. Um, 
One thing that I understand is that it's, as Dina says, and everyone experiences, is that it's very, very difficult to understand and also for Global South scholarship to really gain a more a critical mass, a momentum, if we're all not reading the same 15,000 word pieces, which, you know, many are published a year. So for those Global South scholars who are interested, if you have written a very long piece or have, you know, new ideas for your next long piece, but you just want to summarize what you have already written or coalesce what you're now thinking, please do write it up in 1500 words and <laughs> share it with us. We will work with you and then get it, get our Global South voices online. Yeah. Okay. Well said, well said. We're kind of testing the waters. It's a good place to test the waters as well. Um, and uh, Wei Ling, and then I'll give the last word to Yvette. Okay, so very quickly, um, I think that one thing that really attracted me to the blog's mission and to join the team was the emphasis on diversity. And everyone has talked about diversity inclusion, but one aspect I want to emphasize is that I think it's important to include voices outside uh, academia. So I think it's great that um, there were been pieces published by the blog, written by practitioners, civil society actors. And I think this is important because when we're talking about the democratization of international law and state actors that are making state practice, these we really should look beyond academia and the blog can be an important platform for these voices. Thank you so much, Wheeling. Well said as well. And Yvette, our wonderful uh, managing editor who takes care of everything. She coordinates everything, really. So we all give a special hand to... to... So you have kind of a... So what about you, Eva? What, how are oh, you... Um, as a managing editor, and also I work very closely with Jerry, our unsung hero who works <laughs> very, very hard for the blog too. Uh, she's not on screen, but she is here. Um, so I dedicate a lot of thanks to her. Um, Maybe just a personal anecdote. Uh, I didn't really write much before uh, in terms of like publishing like about international law. My first step was a, a blog post. So I think if that says anything, it's really a solid first step to a long and invested career in international law. So please submit to our portal. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Well, I can't believe it. It's gone. We've gone over an hour, but I want to thank each and of each and every one of you, uh, the panelists, the editors, and all of you who've stuck with us through this one hour plus panel. And Massimo, so sorry you couldn't be with us, but thanks, Martins, for filling in that gap a little bit. Um, so, yes, please submit. Keep your eye on CIL dialogues. We are only going to grow and get better. Uh, and um, and it's been a delight and happy new year again to everyone. And thank you all, the invisible participants there. And I, I, know, I know quite a few of you actually. So thank you so much for joining us. Take care. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.